Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Orthodoxy Questions and Answers. Well, we're still on hiatus, but we've still got a lot of questions that you guys have given us, and so we want to continue to answer those. Now, remember, we're going to be doing it for another two weeks, and then we'll be back in August live. All right. Uh, we have a lot of questions, but before we begin, uh, we have another question. Uh, uh, Christian icon of a uh, epic battle. Uh, right. So last week we had uh, Saint George, and again, what we've got here, I just get these really interesting icons again from these different families when they when they give it. And and I got this one, and I thought it was really interesting. It is Archangel Michael battling the demons again. Uh, uh, Archangel Michael, the warrior angel. Uh, every time now, I think of Archangel Michael. I can't help but think of John Travolta, right? Oh, yeah, Michael. From from Michael. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. you know, with the with the cigar as he's walking down the steps with the cigarette hanging out of his mouth and all that. that I just, that's I, a deep take. I don't know how many people remember that movie. That was uh that was that was different for, for him, but that was it was it was kind of a different movie. Uh but here clearly it displays uh you know that he is the warrior angel battling uh the demons. I've never seen an icon before like that, so I just had to put it on the show and just show it off. And again that classical uh uh, Greek American style that you see there. And do we as Orthodox have a general belief that demons? Uh, I mean, I know there's artistic liberty taken with this icon, but I'm going to use this icon as a as an opportunity to ask some of these questions. But uh, do we believe that they have uh, gargoyle-like wings and claws like that? Or no, no. Again, it's just a de a depiction that in our minds sets that demonic nature. So. You know, it, it makes it clear in the iconography of who he is battling and who we are then battling. But do we believe that uh, Satan is a horned uh, uh, goat like figure? No. But what did the goat do? Goats are awesome. I know. Right. <laughs> you know, we uh, I think probably more than likely he's probably like um, uh, Al Pacino in uh, The Advocate. In <laughs> The Devil's Advocate? The Devil's Advocate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's... <laughs> That's an interesting movie. Oh, yeah, especially the painting in the ball, man. That is, that is Which, freaky. All right. So we have the first question from online from uh, Rick Alex. I wonder if Father could give any words on the Orthodox Study Bible, published by Thomas Nelson in 2008. I'm thinking of picking this book up for further study into the Orthodox view on the Old and New Testament. Would this be a good source, or should I pass it on? So... Orthodox Study Bible, right? Got one on the uh, got one on the shelf. I'm just uh, looking here to see. Uh, she said 2008, huh? 2008. Uh, Thomas Nelson. Thomas Nelson. Orthodox Study Bible, 2008. I don't know about Nelson, but Saint Athanasius Academy of Orthodox Theology is what I have here. All right. Um, so the answer to your question is is yes. The Orthodox Study Bible, this particular one, the original one that came out was just the New Testament, and it wasn't really cleared through the uh, the school of theology uh, with the professors there. But what they did with the Orthodox Study Bible, which now contains Old and New Testament, is that the commentary that is provided here was researched and approved by the uh, professors of the uh, Holy Cross uh, Greek Orthodox um, School of Theology and Seminary. And what's wonderful about this is at the bottom, so you have obviously scripture here, but then at the bottom there is then the Orthodox commentary. And the vast majority of that Orthodox commentary clearly is in line with what our Orthodox theology is. So I like this as a companion because as I'm reading through, I can read down here and then I can see what is now the Orthodox interpretation of particularly difficult passages of scripture. So this is like an Orthodox... To put it simply, kind of an Orthodox NIV Bible. Um, in a way, the New International yeah, Version. Yes, right? yeah, yeah, There's yeah. There's explanations for everything. Right, right, right. Exactly, exactly. You know, not a concordance, so to speak, but, you know, yes, it. Uh, it uh, I think they did, a, a, from everything that I've read in this, uh, and I know the professors who, commentary, who commented on this, and so I think that this is uh, this is a very good book to have in the library. All right. 
Moving in completely the opposite direction, we also got saw this online, and we had to we had to <laughs> we had to address it from uh, Vinegar. Why are and this might be offensive? Why are so many Greeks fat? Hmm. Well, I mean, um, I would say uh, if you go to if you go to Europe, and certainly if you go to Greece, you will find that there are many people there that really aren't overweight because there is much more of a um, um, a much less reliance on vehicles. I mean, in terms of the people that they live in the villages, there's much more, they're much more inclined to walk. And we know this uh, both from um, from spending time in, in Scotland to spending time in Greece, is that when you go shopping there, uh, most of the food, it, the idea of organic doesn't even make any sense, really, because all of the food there is locally produced. And so there's really no pesticides or processing or anything like that for the most part, for the most part. So when we buy our food, it only lasts a couple of days. So we buy almost on an every other day basis. And that healthy food doesn't have all that processing. There's a, always a, a butcher where we can get our meats. Uh, there's always a, a farm, a farmer's market or some type of open market where we can get our vegetables. So in that sense, combine that with there's a lot of walking going around, uh, wa walking being done. A lot of dancing. A lot of, and you're right, a lot of, a lot of dancing, unfortunately, a lot of drinking. All right. <laughs> uh, but the meals are much more healthy. Here in America, it's not just Greeks who are overweight, but it's generally the American population because of the food that we eat. We have become this fast food oriented culture. So we don't shop like Europe shops. So we don't prepare meals on an everyday basis. We don't have enough time to do that. All right. So what we do is it's easier to stop at McDonald's or Kentucky Fried Chicken or order a pizza. And we do way too much of that. So I don't think it's a I don't think it's a cultural thing for us. I think it's the fact that that the processed foods that we're eating and our sedentary lifestyle, meaning that we drive everywhere in America, we're not really a um, we're not a walking culture and we're not a uh, transportation oriented culture our bus systems in america aren't really that good our subway systems aren't that good but in europe oh man it's just i mean that's how people get around so there's much more off the couch kind of well, walking yeah, the around the auto industry destroyed our uh, destroy, yeah, system. yeah. Mean, um so so, yeah, I don't think it's fair to say Greeks are fat. No, no. I mean, but, you know, this is this is something that's uh, the, the fast food culture is invading the entire West. And that it, it, yeah. and it's starting to. In, yes. Uh, when you say West. Yeah. Yes. Now there's more McDonald's in Greece. Or we're seeing them in the UK when we're there now. And also, you know, when we eat in when, you know, when Terry and I go out and we eat in Europe and especially we saw this when we lived in Germany, the meal was the evening. Now it's uh, here in America. It's a it's a it's a thing to do before the event. So let's go grab something to eat really quick. Then we're going bowling. We're going to go see a movie. We're going go karting. We're doing something. Okay. So that meal is hurry up, eat that meal, right? Prelude. Uh, yeah, it's just a prelude. It's nourishment. When we were in Germany, when we went out to eat, it's a four hour experience. We sit down. We have a few app. Well, first off, it takes some 15 to 20 minutes just to come to the table. Right. OK. Then we get our drinks. Then we get the appetizers. Then we get the meal. And then we get the meal in stages. And then we get some type of after dinner drink. So we're having this conversation and the the time that we're taking to slowly digest the food and certainly the portions are nowhere near the size i mean an american plate is like about you know this big yeah. right you know and a european plate is like about this big so the portion sizes are also different but in don't Europe. a lot of those venues also have like live music and dancing like there's a lot more than just eating at some of these places no yeah, some some yeah. do but the restaurants in germany that we went to that was it that was yeah. it. we just sat around and we just talked we just enjoyed each other's company so it was very easy and relaxing to digest our food over a long period of time and then we walked home and of course you know these these comments are ba not based on anybody who has a like a health issue that's right yeah right yeah. right mm -hmm. um all right moving on 
Um, this is in response to a video that we made about uh, uh, menstruation and communion. Yes. Uh, from Melanie. Which woman in her right mind would receive Holy Communion when she's menstruating? There are many other times when she can, so why receive the most holy blood of Christ and lose it at the same time? Uh, there's absolutely no relationship between uh, between the blood of menstruation and receipt of Holy Communion. Again, this is a Jewish ideal that the Greeks have brought into uh, have, have brought into the Christian or the Orthodox faith. Okay, this was never part of uh, never part of our faith, and so this is a natural process that happens. And this is this is God given to us. And so, why should we call it bad? And why should we call it disgusting? Or why should we call it uh, that it's it's not proper? No, these are not Orthodox ideals. What we what you are receiving when you receive Holy Communion is you are receiving that for for your humanly salvation. God, it, God in the person of Jesus Christ has come for the salvation of the image and likeness of God, which is all of us. And, and, and menstruation in no way pollutes or destroys or defaces that image. And when we allow ourselves to think like that, then we are falling into a, we're, we're falling into a, uh, um, uh, what's the word I want to say here? I can think of many things you can fall into. <laughs> okay, right, right. But we're falling into, in, into a trap of wrong theology, all right? If that woman feels that this is the appropriate time that she wants to receive communion because she is spiritually moved to receive it, then the Orthodox Church is not about to stand in her way. This comes from an ancient, uh, this comes from, uh, and, and when I say ancient, I mean not ancient like, Homer ancient, but uh, but uh, but a very very old connection between Jewish faith and then Christian faith. I hate to ask this question, but I'm going to ask the question that I'm sure a lot of people have on their mind, but they don't want to type out. All right, mm -hmm. what I mean, how can menstruation be considered something that's dirty, and yet defecation is not? I mean, like if somebody went to the restroom in the morning. Is he not allowed to receive Holy Communion because that's something that's dirty? Or is it, that's that's given a pass because, because that's something that affects both men and women. Yeah, and again, it is, you know, you know Greek, Greece is a patriarchal society of, of, of late. I mean, of late, I mean the last, let's say, let's say 100 to 200 years. We have been patriarchal. Okay, so in that sense, we have picked up on the idea you know, that women have a subjugated place in the church. And that in itself is not orthodox. And one of the th weapons that they've used for that is this idea now of menstruation being something that's that's dirty. So there is a little bit something truth in there. Now, interestingly enough, the canons of the church are very specific. They say that no one may serve before the altar, in, in front of the altar, if they have a discharge of any bodily fluid, this is what the canons say. So I cannot perform liturgy if I am if I've got a cut and I'm bleeding from that cut, nor can I nor can I serve at the altar altar if I've just had, you know, marital relations. I mean, but, you know, th this is in the canons yeah, yeah. of the church for good reason. OK, but this is th but that woman is not serving before the altar now. If she were, let's say we return to the deaconess program, and she was in the time, in the cycle of menstruation, then yes, she would not be allowed to serve. Absolutely. So if you want to stop an Orthodox wedding, all you have to do is give the priest a paper cut? Well, it's got to be pretty significant, though. Yeah. <laughs> I could put a Band-Aid on it. All, <laughs> right. all right, we have a few questions about icons. First up from Punchy, is there a resource, a website or a book, that goes over all the styles of icons in further detail than the video we made about icons that someone could recommend. The icons are my favorite parts of orthodoxy. Well, and they are very, very beautiful. And, uh, you know, I just, I happen to have these two books on my desk. I don't know how they got here, but here they are. You, mm. you don't have to stand up to do show and tell? I don't have to stand up. I So, one of them... Now, again, there are plenty of resources online, but these are two beautiful books. One of them is 
Perfect. Byzantium, right? And in this book, it's a history of Byzantium, and in there you'll find, I do have to stand up yeah. for this, you'll find some beautiful artifacts, but also quite a bit of iconography that is historic in the church. So this is one book that was done very, very beautifully that has artifacts of the Byzantine Empire, which obviously include then many of our icons. There is another book. The Glory of Byzantium. Can you see that? Yeah. I'll, I'll type this in the description. Oh, okay. All right. And this also has now the same type of thing, but also not just iconography, but also then mosaics and then marble reliefs, things like that. And so there's... There's icon. There's iconography of some of the churches in here. So these are two books that uh, are full color and are and beautifully display the glory of iconography. And there's also this really really good book, Byzantine art, and that has some great history of Orthodox iconography. It's not in color, all right, but there is the history of then iconography, both from a mosaic perspective and from an iconograph iconograph iconographic yeah. perspective. Yeah, and I, I, iconography, right. iconographic. Iconographic perspective. You Thank you. There we go. <laughs> and uh, and Demos will give you the links to all of these. Uh, uh, yeah, the the name of the author. Yeah, because I'm sh I assume you can buy them on several sites. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the second question we have about um, icons actually refers to something you alluded to earlier uh, from Stephen. What would you do as a priest if you were sent to a church that has heretical icons on display? Before we get into that, uh, what would be an example of a heretical icon? Well, actually, um, uh, Demos, has a, Demos has a picture of one in our own Annunciation Church here in Rochester. Uh, and as you can see, this particular icon, which is referred to as the Ancient of Days, depicts not only Jesus Christ, but it also depicts God the Father and represents him as an old man. Now, there are many other churches that I've been to that have this particular icon. In fact, it was hanging on the wall when I went to seminary. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and we all agreed that we need to take it down. All right, so was it was it taken down? Yeah, yeah. We we ended up we ended up taking it down. All right, but in our church, as you can see, this icon is a mosaic. So I'm not going to now destroy the harmony of the iconography in our church by ripping this out. I mean it. It is what it is. We recognize that it is a heretical icon. And in fact, if you look to the left of that icon, you will see the true icon, which represents the Trinity, which we call the hospitality of Abraham. So the answer is, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to leave it in place. There's an understanding that at the time it was thought to be OK, but not recognized as a heretical icon and the people know it and we just move forward you know i hate to say it like this but um there is another way to view this because okay how you don't get you know, how many people have conversations about that specific icon when they come and, and experience no. liturgy right. right nope but how many times have you used that icon as a educational tool uh you know that's a good point i never thought about that in fact many times on the church tours during the festival mm -hmm. uh, i will bring that up i will say that you know not every icon is drawn th that is drawn represents our orthodox theology and here is an example of something like that so yes it does become an educational tool to speak about what makes an icon heretical all right now we have uh, this is this is about this is a seven part question. Which oh, is, which is exactly well, well thereabouts. That'll be the end of the show. <laughs> which is exactly what we asked. We you said this if this was an opportunity to ask those long detailed questions. And this question is from Anesti, uh, who has uh, questions about this specific phrase in the creed. The phrase being. And in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. Question number one. What exactly 
doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. All right. So the the word that is used in the creed is ek porevete. So porevo, right, to proceed, okay, or to come, uh, an ek out of, so to move or to or to come out of a source, okay. So in that sense, what it what it means is what is the source of where the Holy Spirit proceeds. And in both the Orthodox and the Catholic Church, there is the agreement that, that the Holy Spirit proceeds ek porevi from that which is the beginning, that which is the adhi, and that is the Father. All right. Question two. And some of these might have been answered, but just in case you have something extra to add, I'll ask it. Um, why does the Holy Spirit proceed from the Father? It sounds to be like the Holy Spirit came out of the Father or was made from the Father, which wouldn't make sense if God, the Trinity, is one in essence and worshiped together as one God. So the Orthodox, as I mentioned, the Orthodox and Catholic Church agree that God, the Father, is the source of all things. So now, we have to remember what St. Basil said. The poverty of human language does not allow us to express divine concepts. So we got to keep that in mind first. So we can't get wrapped around a word because the Holy Fathers did the best they could with the words that they had available to them. And in this case, the word proceed was the best word that they could use to indicate that there was a source now for, or there was a beginning for the Holy Trinity. Remember, it is always the will of the Father, the action from the Son, the sanctification by the Holy Spirit. But it is the Father's will, which Jesus Christ, as the Son, follows. Those are in harmony. And the Holy Spirit sanctifies all of that will. So we can't get wrapped around the axle about the fact that, well, okay, you know, how does he come out of that? Because the answer is, at least for Orthodox, we don't know because we don't have the ability to express concisely divine concepts. All right, I'm going to combine these two, but I have a feeling that you kind of answered it. But once again, I, I want to give an essay her due. Uh, Jesus teaches us that everything stems from the Father. So that is, does that mean the Son and the Holy Spirit stem or come out from the Father? Is it perhaps just poor wording or syntax because it sounds to be like it's proclaiming that the Holy Spirit was made by the Father? Well, okay, so we, uh, again, poverty of language. And, and, and begotten is another problematic word, okay? Because when we say, and I have the, the, the creed here from the Divine Liturgy, we say... And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, Tomono Yeni. Okay, so Yenome or Yinome is to be made from something, to, to come into, to, you know, to be born. Okay, all of the Holy Fathers realized Christ is not born. He is, he is unbegotten. I'm sorry, the Father is unbegotten, meaning there is no beginning. But we, the word that the fathers chose to use was monoyeni, only begotten. So does it mean that he was made out of the Father? No, because it's just a placeholder semantically to give some indication now of what is that relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We as Orthodox truly believe that God is God the Father is the Adhi. And from that Adhi then comes the other two persons of the Holy Trinity in a begotten sense which we do not understand. All right, and the final part of, uh, of the essay. Um, so with all that said, do we as Orthodox Christians view the Father as the first among equals of the Trinity? 
No. So we do not. We, it's not like the, the patriarch of Constantinople is the first among equals. No, they each are. They each are God. They're not three that make up a God. They are God. How this relationship exists, we don't know. We, we cannot explain. And so even the words that we use, St. Basil will say, are poverty before divine concepts. But no, it is not the father, the first among equals. All right. The only thing that we say is that it is the father that wills things into existence. And it is the son who then makes that happen. He is the word of God. But then, you know, this brings us to another question because, you know, and very quickly, uh, this brings us to the point of the of this procession. All right. So we have the addition by the Catholic Church of who proceeds from the Father and the Son. And the Orthodox rejected this addition to the, to the, uh, uh, the Ecumenical Council of Constantinople in 381, which formed the essence of the creed, the words of the creed. And so the question now becomes, you know, is it, is that correct? Is it is that that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, or is it the way that it is in the Creed, which is the Father proceeds? I'm sorry, the, the 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 Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. It's interesting because when we look at John, and we look in chapter 14, we're going to see something a little different from what we find in chapter 15. In chapter 14, what Jesus says, "I, Jesus, not not I'm not Jesus." Okay. <laughs> Just right. Just wanted to make sure, make that point. Okay. Well, we should talk about theosis while we're right. at it. Theosis, right. Okay. But in, in chapter 14, verse 16, Jesus says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, Holy Spirit, to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. But then in, ver, in chapter 15, verse 26, he says, when the advocate comes, Holy Spirit, whom I, Jesus, will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify. So here we have two different concepts. One, he says, I will ask the Father and he will send you the advocate. In 15, in chapter 15, we have the advocate whom I will send to you. And so what we have is now the Catholic Church focusing more on Verse 15, and we have the Orthodox Church focusing a little bit more on verse uh, on, on chapter 14, verse 16. Interestingly enough, those who say that the early church in the East did not support the concept of the Filioque, I mean, the Filioque came much later, that's not true. We have St. Cyril of Alexandria who said, since the Holy Spirit, when he is, when he is in us, affects our being conformed to God, and he actually proceeds from the Father, Father and the Son. And then recently we have our own Bishop Kalistos Ware, well respected among Orthodox theologians, who says, qualifying the firm position taken when I wrote my book, The Orthodox Church, 20 years ago, I now believe, after further study, that the problem is more in the area of semantics and different emphasis than in any basic doctrinal differences. And so now what we get to is a question of semantics. As I mentioned before, the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church absolutely believe that the, that the beginning of the Holy Spirit, where he proceeds from, is from the Father. There is absolutely no, uh, no uh, disagreement in that. But what there is a disagreement is, is, in, the, uh, is in the procession of the Holy Spirit from and the Son. And so it's interesting because we have ekpore vete to proceed out of, and we have proiti proitimi, which means now to send forward or to send to another. So we have two different Greek words here that have a slightly different meaning. And the Latin translation now used, and, and again, I'm just, not that I'm a Latin scholar, used proceedit, okay, from the Vulgate translation. And that can have a much more general meaning that envelops both ekporevete and proitimi. 
And what the Latins, the Catholic Church, was more expressing was the second word, which was to send out and not or de-emphasizing the fact of, of the ekporevita, of what is the source. So when we talk about the filioque, it's not a simple, you know, we say this and the Catholic Church says that. We both agree on a base principle, but semantically, we there was an issue in terms of the Latin words versus the Greek words that were used. I think there's a lot of confusion when it comes to the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Trinity. Um, and that might be because out of, out, out of the three persons of God, the Holy Spirit doesn't really have much of a speaking role in the Bible. God the yeah. Father speaks many times. times. Jesus, obviously. And I think the Holy Spirit, he, he speaks to Timothy. I think he speaks to Philip in Acts. But even then, so, it's... Um, it's, he's, the most, he's the most mysterious. It's, he's very yes, yeah. yes, yes. the The person of the Holy Trinity, uh, uh, the person of the Holy Spirit, is the most mysterious of uh, of, of all of the uh, of, of 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 the three of the persons of the Trinity. Absolutely. So why why is uh, he depicted as a bird? Um, where that where that comes from is in the opening line of Genesis. It speaks about the Holy Spirit hovered over the waters. And the Jewish word that is used there has the connotation of a hen sitting on her eggs and protecting her eggs. So there is that there is that uh, symbolism there. Oh, as a kid, I was always told that there was a Holy Spirit that uh, told Noah that the uh, the 40 days were up. <laughs> um well, we did have we did have right the the, the dove yeah, right yeah, that's, and that's, and yeah. and certainly in the New Testament right and the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove right yeah. so we have so we have those three kind of connections that that the Holy Spirit usually is described of in in a bird like fashion but again we don't want to turn the Holy Spirit into a bird right all right well you know in the same line we have a question from the unanswering atheist okay the right channel um where did god come from <laughs> did he always exist as a single all-powerful entity is creating earth his big singular purpose and if not how do we live with that we can break this up a little bit if you want well, so the, the so the first question is, where did God come from? Okay, so uh, so again, you know, you're not going to like the answer, but it, it is the orthodox answer. The orthodox answer is that that is not a question that concerns us because we must start from a basis, and that basis is that God exists. So at least for orthodox. This isn't a question of discussion because it needs to be a starting point. It needs to be a basis. And out of that basis then can come Trinitarian theology, the, the purpose of Jesus Christ, um, and, uh, and why God made man, and so on and so forth. But for us as Orthodox, that question is a basis and and thus is not important to us. Would it, I mean, would... A simple answer as like we don't know we're not capable of understanding something. yeah we're not yeah. capable of understanding because I can't find a reference frame from which I can observe God outside of God so did God always exist absolutely we were he is unbegotten outside of time God himself we believe invented time God exists out of time. In fact, the the liturgy exists out of time. Uh, the the um, uh, uh, heaven, hell exists out of time. This is why we don't get caught up in this whole idea as Orthodox. We don't get caught up in this whole idea of of the memorial service and how can the saints be asleep, but they still can talk, speak to us because we're thinking in a linear time. Uh, bounded fashion and they do not exist in time any longer so how can we place ourselves in a situation that we can observe what it looks like with no time how do we do that 
Yeah, as human beings, we have enough trouble trying to deal with the finite, let alone the to infinity and, and beyond. beyond. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going there. So, I, I well, I was hoping that somebody would follow me. And so you, you didn't know where I came from. Um, so, all right. So, but but can we know what God's purpose is? We can know what His purpose is for us here on Earth as His created beings. This is what Scripture does for us. It tells us at least what God wants us to know about who we are and what he has done for us and then who he sent for our ultimate salvation. So purpose, we can, as Orthodox, we can understand that, we can explain that, and Scripture serves that purpose. But it only serves the purpose, Scripture only serves the purpose for us. Here, this humanity. Did he create other worlds? What what else has he done? We have no idea. So it's not like some people look at the Bible as some kind of historical book that God told us all about himself. No. All he said was, this is what you need to know for your salvation and so that you can understand me to the extent that I want you to understand me. I, I, and I guess the Bible, I mean, one perspective can be it's written specifically for us as human beings. It, it would be kind of strange in Genesis. All of a sudden it took a... A detour said, and then God spoke to Reptilicus of the planet Axion. Excellent. Right. You know, that would, <laughs> it's, it, religion is hard enough for people to have faith in, little, you know, without but, adding all, all that. My, uh, my, my, uh, my new, my Old Testament professor, he was famous, he was famous for saying, people don't even know how to translate the first few words in the Bible. In the beginning. This is, and our, my Old Testament professor was very famous for saying, that is not necessarily the correct reading. The correct reading could be, in beginning, blah, 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 which indicates that this was a beginning. Not the beginning, but a beginning. To say, in the beginning, right, is not, is then saying, God has told us now everything that he's done. No, it says, in beginning, God did this. Um, all right, moving moving on, and this is somewhat along uh, similar lines, from uh, our good friend Miggs. Uh, what is the Orthodox view on the book of Job? Did God allow Job to suffer to prove the devil wrong, or is the book metaphorical, as some people have said? You know, and and we have to we have to understand that much of what was written in the Old Testament um, is poetry. All right, not everything is poetry, but much of it had metaphorical meaning, and much of it is Jewish poetry. All right, so we can't take everything literally. So yes, there is a school of thought that believes that the story of Job. And Satan as the advocate is a metaphorical, metaphorical story for us in terms of, of what is our relationship or what is the correct relationship between us as his creation to God himself. Others see that as a literal interpretation that Job existed, Satan as the advocate said, okay, and this is exactly how it transpired. There are others that believe that there was a person Job, there certainly is the advocate Satan, obviously God, but there are metaphorical ideas that are being expressed in there. There's a hybrid of these, all right? And so what's important for us to take away from Job, from the book of Job, is in the end, what did Job do? And Job now was righteous before God. And what is very important is the dialogue that Job had with his friends. And to the end, when God the Father comes in and says, okay, who among you can now have, have, have created the world, have done all of these things, and you now speak of of, of what it is that Job now should do. So who are you now to speak without having known who I am and what I have done? And those are the important points. So the idea, did God allow it? We have to say that, yes, he allowed that. All right. He was, he was going to allow the um, uh, uh, Isaac 
to sacrifice his son, no, no, right? No, Abraham. Uh, Abra- Abraham. 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 Uh, Abraham. But in the end, right, he proved his righteousness and God stopped it. Okay, can we see that as some kind of tyrannical, uh, uh, um, uh, oh man, uh, the the word I'm looking, I'm looking for, you know, the the kind of person that plays games games with you, uh, but somebody like in Clash of the Titans, where the gods are shown as just playing with it's a tyrannical po- uh, power player, power player, right? Okay, and we don't, and this is obviously the wrong way to look at what it is that God does. So much of the new, the, much of the Old Testament was written in this metaphorical way to teach morality and to teach ethics, but not necessarily everything to be taken literally. Does not, sorry, let me rephrase. Does allowing and not interfering, do those terms equate here? I mean, if if God just did not interfere, does that equate to him allowing something to happen? Yes, because uh, because we have seen clearly throughout the Old Testament that God has intervened. I mean, certainly by uh, certainly by uh, by freeing the uh, slaves from Egypt, mm-hmm. uh, that He was present in many of the battles of Israel, that He sent His Son. God is very active in the world. So so we do see a difference from allowing and what did you say? And, not interference and, and, and not, not in, interference and not interference. He is a very present present and active God in our lives, but he allows certain things to happen so that, and one of the things he allows is our use of, our free use of our will. All right. Well, we have one final question. Um, Wow. Okay. From the littlest mermaid, not the little mermaid, the littlest mermaid. Uh, Do you have any children film recommendations with good Christian morals. Well, just for our buddy Trench, I'm going to say all dogs go to heaven. No, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, you know, and uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, I was trying to, th- I was trying to think of this, and I should be able to come up with, uh, with, with more. Uh, Demos and I had kind of talked about this. Uh, we talked about a couple of Disney movies. We did talk about uh, Pinocchio. The work that instantly sprung to mind with this question, and one that actually fits the answer. Is it's a short cartoon. It's from the 1970s, uh, made by Disney, but directed by Don Bluth before he left and started his own production mm-hmm. studio. A film called The Small One. Um, it is a Christmas-ish film, but mm-hmm. it's one of those films that, ta- that can take place. You can watch it at any time of the year. Mitch Album does uh, does some really good, uh, re- really good movies, and one of them that we really liked that had a good message. And again, this would be a family movie to watch together. Is uh, the Five People You Meet in Heaven? I thought that that was uh, that was uh, uh, well well done. And and again, Mitch Album, uh, his books are his books are very good, and they keep that very Christian uh, Christian theme. What we try to stay away from are books or uh, or movies. I should uh, movies where it it destroys the theology. Uh, people become angels in heaven, you know, where they return and they've got wings, um, or there is this communication that uh, you know where uh, some loved one comes back, or some loved one is trapped on the earth until something is done to release him back into heaven. Okay, so these are these are movies we want to stay away from because they have nothing to do with Christian theology at all. I know people like to watch them, you know, my whoever it is became an angel, you know, and I see many times monuments where they have they have the picture of him as an a- or her as an angel uh, or uh, he's having this wonderful conversation with me um, and all of that is so pe- people ascending to become angels is what you're saying in a way. Not just the depiction of angels with wings. Oh, no, no. Yeah, people, but people, people transform, transform, transforming yeah. right into angels. So I would say that I would watch out for movies like that, that, that uh, uh, create feel-good concepts that have no theological basis in our Christian faith. And like I said, I think it's also important, too, that we recognize what does not make a Christian film. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of uh, week two. We have uh, we have two more weeks of uh, these pre-recorded adventures, and then the first week of August, you know, God first, where we're back. 
<laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So uh, looking forward to seeing everybody when we get back. And again, remember uh, to uh, to stay with uh, to stay with us. We'll be back again next week.